Everyone has questions. Why am I here? Where will I go when I die? Is there really truth? But not everyone has biblical answers. Welcome to The Pastor Study, a ministry of pastorstudy.org. Join us now as we study the Bible to draw closer to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Here is Pastor Tom Brock. Welcome to The Pastor's Study. Some of you watching this program never go to church, or it's real rare, or it's Christmas and Easter, or it's been years, and I'll tell you what I thought of. When I was 17 years old and my brother was 16, he wanted a motorcycle. Dad said no. My brother went out, bought a motorcycle, and ran away from home for four days. I remember what miserable four days those were. Mom was so worried. I was kind of angry. How could he do this to us? Finally, on the fourth day, my brother called the house. My dad answered the phone. Dad said three words. You get home. And my brother immediately came home, sold his my motorcycle. But you know what, I, if you don't go to church, you know what I think your Heavenly Father would say to you? You get home. You need to come find a good Christian church where you're uh, surrounded by your Christian family. Every Christian is to be in the church. So you get home. And what I want to do on this program is explain why you need the church, why every Christian needs the church. Let me first explain what you don't need from a church. You don't need the church to be McDonald's. A McDonald's church is where everybody goes to church and says, feed me, I want it my way, feed me, and all that matters is that I get spiritually fed. No, no, uh, one reason we go to church is to give, not just to get. I think it's good to be spiritually fed at your church. And if you're not being spiritually fed at your church, you have the right to go somewhere else. I mean, <clears throat> there's a certain very radical Lutheran church in the Twin Cities. It has pushed the pro-gay agenda with a vengeance for years. Well, somebody from that church sees our TV show and called me up. Pastor Brock, our church used to be a good church. Then we got this radical, heretical pastor who's wrecked everything. And I said to this man, I think you've got the right to leave that church. But all my friends are at that church. I know, but you have the right to go to a church that's speeding, feeding you spiritually. All right, so it, that's important, but that's not the only reason you go to church is to be fed. A second thing you don't want in a church, you don't want a church that is a country club. <laughs> Some churches are country club churches. Everything's nice. Everything's respectable. Everything is sweet. And we don't ruffle any feathers. We don't preach about repentance from sin. We don't step on any toes. We don't talk about the need for Christ. We just want to be nice. <laughs> Well, I remember a friend of mine that said, Tom, do you know the three pillars of liberal theology? Number one, God is nice. Number two, we too should be nice. Pillar number three, isn't that nice? And so you don't want a nice church. Across the street from where I live is a Methodist church. I was told by a conservative Methodist pastor friend, that the pastor there is pretty liberal. I visited one Sunday. The service was so nice. You never would have dreamed how to be saved or that you need Christ, but it was so nice and blah. You don't want that. You don't want a country club church. But lastly, you don't want a political party either. If all they preach about at your church is politics, something is wrong. I, there's a balance. I hope your preacher preaches to vote pro-life, to protect unborn children. I hope your preacher preaches to vote for candidates that aren't going to try to force Christians to be complicit with abortion, contraceptives, forcing them to bake a gay wedding cake, this kind of thing. But if all your church does is politics, something's wrong. So you don't want McDonald's, you don't want a country club, you don't want a political party. All right, so why do you need a good church? I'm glad you asked. Let's answer that question. Would you take out your Bible, turn in the New Testament to Ephesians chapter 4, 
the Apostle Paul is writing from prison the book of Ephesians. And he's going to tell us why every Christian needs the church. Let's pray first. Father, we want to pray for those people watching now that rarely or never go to church, that somehow you will get them into a good Christian church for their salvation. Speak to us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Ephesians chapter 4, starting at verse 1. I, the Apostle Paul, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, entreat you. Paul the Apostle is writing this from prison. Paul is hurting. He's suffering when he's writing this. I think the more you live for Christ in this world, the more you will suffer. There's the first reason you need the church. You need the church to help you when you're suffering. And Paul loved the fact that he had Christian brothers and sisters visiting him in prison, praying for him at their worship services. You know, when you go to a church and they have the, the prayer time, isn't it nice that the pastor says, Lord, today we pray for Mr. Ferguson who's got cancer, and we pray for Mrs. So-and-so who lost her husband this week. When you're suffering, we all need Christians to support us in prayer. So that's one big reason you go to church, to help you when you're suffering. Next reason, you need church. Look at verse 1 again. I entreat you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called. The second reason you need church is to help you walk worthy. Not enough to know the Bible. The fight of faith is to get out there into the world and live the Bible. That's hard, and that's why you need the church. Martin Luther said Christians are to be in the world, not of the world. Luther did not believe much in monasteries. He didn't think Christians should go live off on a hill and pray all day. He thought Christians should be right down in the culture, living the gospel. I don't think Luther would, agree, would have agreed with the Amish, that you separate yourself from society. No, we're supposed to go into the society and invade the society with the gospel of Christ. And that's hard, <laughs> and that's another reason you need the church. Another reason we need the church, again in verse 2, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing forbearance to one another in love. Here's the next reason you need the church. You need the church to help you love. One of my earliest memories, I was four or five years old, was going to Sunday school every week, and there was an old man that taught us Sunday school. And I just remember sensing as a kid how much that old man loved us. And then during the year he got sick, never came, went to the hospital, never came back to class. I don't know if he died or what. But you know one reason you need the church is so you can sense the love of Christ through other people and so you can be the love of Christ to them. Another reason we need the church. Look at verse Three. being diligent to preserve the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace there is one body that's the church and one spirit the holy spirit just as you were called in one hope of your calling one lord one faith one baptism one god and father of us all who is over all through all and in all you hear the word one a lot there <laughs> there's the next thing you need in a church you want and you need a united church. Not a church that's fighting all the time. You know, I, there are some people that really know how to divide the church. I remember an old, white-haired Lutheran pastor saying, some church people are like an unbroken horse. You never know when they're going to buck. <laughs> and there was... Uh, a day when some, not me, but another pastor uh, preached and this difficult couple criticized him and the old white-haired pastor said to the other pastor, when you throw a brick into a pack of dogs, the one that yelps is the one that got hit. <laughs> when you go to church, you want a united church. Now you won't be perfectly united till heaven, but you want a church that's basically united. Another reason we need the church, skip down to verse 11. And God gave some in the church as apostles, some as prophets, some as evangelists, 
some as pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saint. Here's the next reason. You need the church so you have a place to use your gifts. There are 19 gifts of the Holy Spirit according to the New Testament. Every Christian has at least one gift. So your job is to find out what your gift is and then go to church so you'll have an arena in which to use your gift to serve the Lord. Look at verse 12. God gave these gifts for the equipping of the saints, that's holy ones or believers, for the work of service. The next reason you need the church is to help equip you. It says there that God gave pastors to the church to help equip the saints to go do the work of the ministry. Do you know what the word pastor means? It means shepherd. And do you know that it's not the shepherd's job to produce sheep? <laughs> Anatomically, the shepherd can't produce sheep. Who produces the sheep? The sheep produce the sheep. <laughs> and the pastor's job is to equip you, the believers, so you can go out and you can produce more sheep. And let, look at verse 12. To equip the saints to do what? For the work of ministry. Here's the next reason you need the church. You need the church to do your ministry. You've got a ministry, a service that the Lord wants you to do. This is why people who think they go to church by sitting in front of a TV show like this, they're not, the t you can't minister to a TV set. You can't serve a TV set. If you think you've been to church by watching this TV show, you've missed it. Because big part of the church is you going there to minister. Now, if you're a shut-in and you can't get out, then okay. And we do this TV show because we believe in TV ministry, but this isn't the church. You need, need to be in a church. Next reason we need the church, verse 12, for the work of ministry to the building up of the body of Christ, that means the church. Here's the next reason you need church, to build you up. There are no Lone Ranger Christians. You cannot be a Christian all by yourself in this world. You need the church to build you up. And, verse 13, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature man, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. The next reason you need the church? You need the church to become spiritually mature. Let's talk about spiritual maturity. One day this lady comes up, Pastor Brock, why aren't the pastors wearing their robes at the second service? Well, she hadn't been to church for four years because we hadn't been wearing them for four years. I said, well, ma'am, at the 8 o'clock service, it's more traditional. We wear the traditional robes. The 10 o'clock service is more contemporary, so we don't wear the robes. Well, if the pastors aren't going to wear their robes at the second service, I'm just going to have to find another church. <laughs> and I thought, talk about majoring in the minors. Let me tell a, a spiritually mature church does not debate what color the carpeting should be. A, a spiritually mature church is so concerned on how do we reach our neighborhood for Christ? How do we bring people to saving faith in Christ? How can we help foreign missions overseas? How, what can we do for the Christians that are being beheaded and persecuted in Iran? You know, uh, the, a spiritually mature church uh, is what you need, and you need to be in a spiritually mature church to grow. Another reason we need the church is verse 14. As a result, we are no longer to be children tossed here and there by waves, carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness, craftiness in deceitful scheming. The other reason you need the church? You need the church to protect you from deception. I thought of a young woman named Debbie. She came to our Lutheran church every week, and then during the week she studied with the Jehovah's Witnesses who would come to her house. And I tried to explain, Debbie, Jehovah's Witnesses do not really believe in the Bible. They don't believe Jesus is the Lord God, and, and I got into all of it. So we got Debbie into a good Christian fellowship where every week she's studying the Bible with other believers, and she got protected from deception. Now and then, I'll get a letter from a viewer of our TV show. This has happened a few different times. Pastor Brock, I don't go to church anymore because the church doesn't understand the Bible properly like I do. So now I just sit home and read the Bible. And then you listen to what they believe. They get theologically weird 
trying to be a Christian all by themselves. And no, you're not the only proper interpreter of scripture. Every Christian needs to be in a good church where we are correcting each other as we study the Bible together. <laughs> One more reason you need the church is verse 15. but speaking the truth to one another in love. Here's the next reason, reason we need the church, to speak the truth to you in love. You need that somebody to speak the truth to you in love. So I'm talking with a Christian woman, and pardon my language, but we're talking and, oh my God. And then when somebody does that, it's, okay, Lord, do I talk to them about that or not? And we keep talking. Oh, my God, she does it four times. And finally, I said, you know, no offense, but do you know that's taking the Lord's name in vain? Second commandment, you don't do that. And, oh, okay, Pastor. But, you know, we need to gently, lovingly speak the truth and love to one another. That's another reason to go to church. And the last reason we need the church is verse 16. We are to speak the truth in, in love. We are to grow up in all aspects unto Christ, who is the head, from whom the whole body, the church, being fitted and held together by that which every joint supplies according to the proper working of each individual part, causes the growth of the body, the church, for the upbuilding of itself in love. Here's the last reason you need the church. You need the church so you can do your part. According to that verse, the church is like the body of Christ, a finger, nose, everybody's a different part. When every part is doing their gift, the church grows and people get saved. So why do you need the church? You need the church to help you grow, to protect you from deception, to um, uh, help you not be driven about by every wind of doctrine so you can become a mature Christian, so you can speak the truth and loves, to help you when you're suffering, etc. There's a bunch of reasons. We've only done some of them. But, you know, I urge you, if you don't have a church, you got to find a good church and go. Uh, again, I, I, I saw in front of a church a big sign, C-H blank blank C-H, and it said, what's missing? The answer is, you are. I saw another church that said, yes, we are open between Christmas and Easter. And I just want to say to you, if you don't go to church, what my dad said to my brother a gazillion years ago, you yeah. get home. If you don't have a good church, you get out of bed, you get the good uh, effort. It's going to take a while maybe to find the right one, but start going to church every week. Your eternal soul is worth you being in church once a week. Amen. Welcome to the portion of the pastor study where we now ask Pastor Brock to share with us his knowledge of scripture and his insights to answer questions we have regarding the Bible, our Lord, and our everyday walk with him. Pastor Brock, what would you say to someone who says the church is full of hypocrites? The answer to that is room for one more because everybody is a hypocrite. We're, we're all sinners. Nobody lives up perfectly to what they know they should. That's why we need church. That's why we need a savior, Jesus, to save us from our sins. So somebody who thinks they are above the church and they're not sinful like the church people are. No, no, everybody's sinful. Don't let your superiority, supposedly, keep you from being in a church where you grow. Okay, some people say they leave the church because they've been burned by the church. Mm -hmm. What are they talking about? Well, then? you know, people, who I, I got hurt because you know, maybe there's a really good, valid reason people uh, leave a church because they were hurt, and I've heard some good ones. But, you know, uh, they don't wear robes at the second service. <laughs> so, you know, here's the deal. What, Jackie, you, you had the same job for many years. You got burnt at that office periodically. You go to church, you go to school, you go to the office. Wherever. Everybody gets burnt by the school, by work. That doesn't mean you stop going to school. Doesn't mean you stop going to the office. Doesn't mean you stop going to church. You, well, if you've been burnt by the church, then you, then you ask God to give you the grace to forgive people and to go back to the church. Do you change churches? You could. If, if, I mean, if, for instance, I, if I was like the person I talked to, if I went to that church where, that promotes abortion rights, homosexuality, etc., I wouldn't go to that church. I think you have the right then to switch churches. But if it's small stuff, 
you just live with it. Yeah. Okay. You know, there, people are getting older, and it seems like a lot of people find it hard to get out of their house mm -hmm. and that. And we have a couple that wants to know if it's okay if they just watch church on yes. TV. Yep, we got a phone call. We got a, a letter on that. The, these two older women, and is it okay if we just watch church on TV? And I said, if you can't get out, yes. But if you can get out, go to church. And, and if you really can't get out, it'd be nice if you could call the pastor and say, can somebody give me Holy Communion at home? Most churches will do that. So it's nice to stay connected even if you're a shut-in. You know, I think, too, some of the shut-ins are afraid to ask for help. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, there are people who would be willing to pick them up and let them bring mm -hmm. them to the church. That's right. That's right. So how does a person find a good church? You know, if, if somebody was watching this and you don't go to church, um, I've done this many times on the TV. You just, uh, there are good Lutheran churches and there are awful Lutheran churches. There are good Methodist churches, Baptist churches, Presbyterian churches, etc., and there are awful Methodist, Presbyterian, Baptist churches. Here's what you got to do. I've said this a hundred times. You go to church. And maybe it's a nice church, but you're not sure if it's a biblical church. So you say after church, Pastor, I'm thinking of coming to this church. Can I ask a few questions? Number one, does this church teach the Bible is the highest authority in the Christian life, the infallible word of God? Number two, do you believe there's a heaven and a hell? Number three, do you believe Jesus is the only way to heaven? Number four, what are your views on premarital sex, abortion, and homosexuality? Number five, do you believe in the miracles of the Bible, that Jesus was born of a virgin, that he raised the dead, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera? And if you get tap dancing, oh, that's, a, that's a, a complex issue, get to a different church. You want pastors that will say, of course we believe Jesus is the only way to heaven. Of course there's a heaven and a hell. So that, that's the way you scout it out, Jackie. Okay. If a person goes to a church that claims to be the one true church, should they stay there? You know, not too many years ago, all the Catholics, not I shouldn't say all, not too many years ago, the Catholics thought the Lutherans were going to hell. The Lutherans thought the Catholics were going to hell. And... Um, there are certain Christian denominations that are so tiny and so narrow that you get the impression, Jackie, that if you're not a member of their denomination, you're not saved. I, I, would, av I would avoid those kinds of churches. There's going to be Baptists, Methodists, Lutherans, Evangelicals, all kinds of Christians in heaven. And if you, there, I won't say the name of the one church, but there's certain church. No, no, you have to be this. Eh, I think I'd go elsewhere. Do you think in heaven we're going to know the difference between those different churches? I don't think so. Okay. Uh -huh. All right. Um, can a person give Holy Communion to themselves if they're, like, shut in in that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, I have a friend, and he's not shut in. He goes to church, but he often gives Holy Communion to himself. And I told him, I've got a problem with that. Because part of Holy Communion, it's in the New Testament, it's always done in the, in the body of believers with other Christians. So I think it's fine to do it at a retreat or at your church. But for you all by yourself to give yourself Holy Communion, part of what's wrong with that is Paul says, you know, don't we all share one loaf and we all one body in Christ? Part of Holy Communion is the symbolism of being one with other believers. So I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't give communion to myself by myself alone. Okay. Yeah. Um, it seems like there's a serious theological error in a church, and people want to stay in it because they have friends that are there. Mm -hmm. Is it okay to do that and try to turn it around, or are you just knocking well, your head against a wall? You know, Jackie, you and I, in our congregation that I served and that you still go to, we've tried for many years to turn the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America around. We got absolutely nowhere. And then they did the deed and decided to affirm homosexual behavior. They pay for abortions with offering dollars. So if you go to a PCUSA Presbyterian Church, an ELCA Lutheran Church, the United Church of Christ, the Episcopal Church in America, these churches have gone so over the cliff. But Pastor Brock, I've been there 50 years. All my friends are there. Well, you got to put the, do you really want to give your money to such an organization? And I encourage people, that ship has sailed. That ship is not turning around. I would encourage people to find a good biblical. There are biblical Presbyterian churches, Methodist churches, Baptist churches, uh, Lutheran churches. Find a good biblical denomination and go there. Okay. 
you were talking about um, the church and that. I guess, is a person obligated to tithe to the church? Well, you know, tithing was an Old Testament concept. You took 10% of your crops and those went to the Lord. And I think uh, in the New Testament, the, the directive is more, Paul says, give as you prosper. So some people say, well, then I don't have to give 10%. My response is, if the Old Testament Jews were moved to give 10% to their God, we Christians who know more about the love of God than the Old Testament Jews, would that move us to give less than 10% or more than 10%? I think Christians should at least tithe. That's my opinion. Okay. If a person hasn't tithed, though, is, how do they get into the yeah. practice? It, it's just a habit. 10% of your paycheck goes to the Lord. I like giving mine all at the beginning of the month. I write one, and I, I like to write kind of one check or whatever, um, or do it every three months even, but I like to do it all up front before I even earn it. A lot of people don't like that. But just every, every week or every month, 10% of your income goes to the Lord. Okay, Pastor Buck, there, it seems like lately you're hearing more about groups of people that are starting like home churches mm -hmm. and going away from the formal church type thing. Mm -hmm. What do you think about that? I, you know, a lot of people, not a lot, and I think this will happen more if we get persecuted in America for our Christian faith, which I see signs of. But um, yeah, there are churches that meet in people's homes, maybe 20 people meeting in the home, and I don't think anything's wrong with that. Um, and you know, there, there's a pastor in a sense, and they have communion together, and they worship and, and learn the Bible. I don't think anything's wrong with that. My experience has been that often those groups don't last very long. So I, I personally, I would prefer to be in a larger group than that. But in the early church, they met in homes. So. Well, I think homes are good for some things, but I think you need that building actually I like that. to feel that you are a part mm -hmm. of a church. Just meeting yeah, in somebody's yeah. home is like right. going out. And once, the, yeah, we're okay. out of time. There Tom. we go. We've talked too much. So, God bless you, and we pray that you'll be granted God's richest blessings until we're together again next time. Thank you for watching the Pastor Study. You can watch more of our programs at pastorstudy.org. We are on the air preaching the gospel of Christ because of our generous support of you, our viewers. Would you consider supporting our ministry? You may do so at pastorstudy.org. Or write the Pastor Study, P.O. Box 41294, Minneapolis, Minnesota 55441. May the blessing of our one triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you today and always.